I'm Dave White, uh, founder and director of the Blind Stokers Club, which is a bicycle club uh, powered by the combined energy and teamwork of pairs of cyclists. Uh, the club got its name uh, from the rear seat uh, of a tandem, which is called the Stoker. My name is Fred Dudek, and I am the uh, captain for John. We are a team from the Blind Stokers Club. I think we're the only team that came into the club together, and we've been riding together for, gosh, over four years now. Stoker's job is to provide the power, and uh, my personal job is to tell jokes on big up hills and try to make <laughs> Fred laugh. <laughs> the captain is the pilot of the the team, and so the captain determines the, the directions, where we're going to go, and also one of the important things, particularly for new teams, is to call out what's going on so the captain lets the stoker know, for example, if we're approaching a red light and we'll need to slow down and stop. Uh, the captain calls out signals and then the stoker gives the signals. So, yeah, for example, yeah. if we're turning right, I will tell that to John and John will give the hand signal. Signal right. We enable uh, people who are blind or visually impaired uh, to share the sport of si cycling with those of us that are sighted. And the front uh, position is called the pilot or captain. Hi, I'm Sabine and I'm the captain in our team. My stoker today and for the last few months is Carol. Good morning. Um, I'm Carol Cochran and I moved out to California last August. And in November, I happened to meet my good friend Sabine, who, ten who is a captain on the Blind Stokers Club. And she is the captain, the leader, and I have to put all my trust and faith in her, and she knows it. The trust I have to put into Sabine in the beginning, because she was a complete stranger to me, was difficult. I have to just let go and put 100% of my faith into Sabine. Yeah, that is, that is something that is really, since you're so close, I mean, we're yeah. not just physically close on the bike, mm -hmm. um, but uh, exactly that too and then we are we are pretty much everything every every movement everything that she makes i feel and anything that i do she feels and if she if she has a bad day and something is going on i can feel that she's tense yes. or and i'm like yep. something's off today what's going on and and, uh, and then we'll pull over and just and, and we'll speak about it right you right know? yeah like, so if like you, good friends so th those of us that can see well uh, we like to sit on the front of the tandem and uh, it enables our uh, blind and visually impaired friends uh, to team up with us and, uh, and that's how we roll uh, in pairs. John and I met in an interesting way. My wife and I were taking a Spanish class at the local community college and I had mentioned to Roxanne that I was interested in joining the Blind Stokers Club and she thought her husband John might be interested. My favorite ride was when we did the uh, Bicycle the Bay loop, which is a, a loop that starts in downtown and, and loops south. It's a 56 mile ride that included a swim in the middle and we did all different kinds of activities. So it, you really couldn't beat that summer ride. There's also the, the Cycling for Sight fundraiser in July, which is really fun. And that's a three day ride that goes up the coast to the University of Irvine and then back. The club uh, exists on a, on a shoestring budget really uh, that is uh, uh, derived entirely from our annual uh, three-day tour, benefit tour, called Cycling for Sight. And the, uh, our primary beneficiary is the San Diego Center for the Blind, and it also uh, funds our very uh, modest budget for the Blind Stokers Club. Well, if there's anybody watching this video who's interested in the Blind Stokers Club, I want to encourage you to come out with us one Saturday or Sunday and give it a try. It's just a great group of folks and you can be paired up with someone that is the right size and, and ability for you. And I think you would have a great time if you checked it out.
the bar and I drink a mojito alone by myself in a crowded bistro and I search and I stare but no one is there to talk with to touch or to care so I change my seat and I sit by the window and look out at the people passing by me now and I drink and I think that someone will notice me all alone by myself at the bar Oh, the people all laugh and they drink and relax and the music that plays just creates a haze In my world that's gone flat I don't know where I'm at So I sit and I stare here all alone sits down next to me at the No. Dad, get the camera and come quick. There's been a crash. I, I saw it in the canyon and it was scary. Alright, relax. Yeah. Calm down. Tell me what happened. I was walking home from school and I saw something crash in the canyon. Come on, we need to go quick. What? There's no time to explain. Come on! Kyle, wait up! Hang on, it's right around the...
So where's this crash of yours? It's gone. Look, why don't we just go back to the house and we can talk this over? No, I, I, I swear, it, it, I saw it. It was, it was like a, a pod thing and it... out. I, I mean, I brought you back here after your rant about- the... Aliens! Did you find them? No. There weren't any. Then they're still out there somewhere. We have to Forget find... about these aliens, all right? We'll talk about this in the morning. Don't let this thing get to you. I think you just need to keep a calm head and think it through. All right. Good night. See you in the morning. Attention students, there will be a mandatory meeting for those who have failed to catch these exams. Just give me one moment, okay? Attention everyone. You are all in danger. We're being invaded by aliens. I recommend... Principal's office, now.
I had always wanted a tattoo, my parents were very against it. Think something about the stigma of a woman having a tattoo. It just appeals to me. And so I'll seek it out and it's all about the space, how it would move around my body. If I find something that intrigues me and it excites me, it could definitely go a lot farther. I was looking at this Japanese magazine this one guy that uh, it would just fascinate me, you know. So I was like, I gotta do this, you know. It's it's re real cool. So that's when I started like doing my suit. Everything in my tattoo is like it tells me about me. So I feel blessed. I'm a tattoo artist by trade. I always have loved art, painting, drawing, ceramics, jewelry, pattern making, anything I can get my hands on. So I bought a little kit, you know, did my thing at home, tattooed myself, tattooed my boyfriend, and everyone that I knew that was a tattoo artist saw my work and said, you're a natural. If someone comes to me and says, you know, I want this type of design, I'll ask them to give me a reference as far as what they like visually, and then I'll create something custom for them. In my 20s, I started thinking about getting tattooed, and uh, one day, uh, found a uh, tattoo shop and walked in and said, you know, I want this style of tribal on my left arm. And I got a bicep piece uh, and got addicted uh, the, the moment that needle hit me. And just looking at it in the mirror, it looked lopsided. So I got the right side done, then I got fully sleeved. And when the entire upper half was done, the lower half looked funny. 
Uh, so I wound up getting my, my lower half uh, done as well. I became a full suit, but not something I intended. I had no idea I would become as, as uh, addicted as I did. I always wanted an Alice in Wonderland piece. Um, one, I've just always loved the story of it. And two, my grandmother's name is Alice, and she is my hero. She's my inspiration. Ever since I was a little kid, I remember my dad looking at his tattoos and just admiring it and wanting to touch it. I knew I wanted to be covered in tattoos. He passed away when I was really young, so in a weird kind of way, it's when I'm getting tattooed, I feel like I have this closeness. It's a one bond that him and I can share. You know, the sad little girl wanting to connect.
I brought that string. <laughs> breaking string, breaking strings and trolleys. <laughs> Thank you. Wander through furrow and meadow, through showers of hail and whistling gales. Seek the sweet sunlight and shadow. Sing it with me. Come on, guys. Play it loud and clear. Oh, wandering mister, am I? Yes, say wandering mister, am I? Oh, wandering mister, am I? Just say one thing, Mr. When I was born, I knew I would walk the flow. All through the flow, all through the flow. I seek no one to call my own. So I walk through the globe, all on my own. So I want to What you put into it is what you get out of it, and uh, you definitely see that every day when you're out here on the farm. Farming is the most therapeutic thing you can do. I mean, uh, when you put your hands in the earth, when your feet touch the earth, when the sun hits your face every day, all those details really just put you in awe, you know? My name is David Solomon and my position is farm manager. I've been working on this land for eight years now. 
uh, three, almost three years with Stone and five years prior to with La Milpa Organica. We have a total of 20 acres. Of those 20 acres, let's say half of it, we lose to the hillside up above and we lose it to oak trees, which is nice because that allows us to have a variety of wildlife. The farm crew is composed of a total of six of us, includes myself, Jessica Sanchez, she's in charge of beautification. Then I have my farm crew, which dedicates to hard farm work. And that's Raul Baza, Max Hernandez, Gabriel Lizarraga, and Santiago Vasquez. And every one member is an integral part of the crew and they all make magic happen. You know, it kind of flows through their veins, if you will. They've done such a great job of helping to take the farm from its past into its future uh, with us at Stone. Stone cares, right? They care about the community. They want to be an integral part of the community. They want the best for the community and be able to say, hey, we grow our own vegetables. And not only are we growing our own vegetables for our restaurants, but we're letting the community come in so they can be a part of it, so they could see it, feel it, so that other people feel comfortable going into their backyards and being able to grow vegetables for themselves. Michael Pollan put so well, is it, is it food or is it food-like? Um, we're interested in food, real food, just as much as we're interested in actual, real beer versus the industrialized facsimile of beer. So these things all fit together. You, you, you can just decide to look at them as you know, single solitary pieces. But what we endeavor to do at Stone is look at these things from as a whole. Well, what you can expect from a tour is definitely a good time. We have awesome tour guides that really understand the farm philosophy. They have a really uh, sophisticated way of being able to portray it so people can really walk away feeling like they understand some of the dynamics that involve the farm and how it works with the bistro, how it works with the brewery, how it works with you know the restaurants. So when you come out here, you, you can have a, a pint of beer, walk around the farm, check out the animals, check out the fields, you know, buy some apparel if, you're, if you like the Stone Farms t-shirt or the Stone Farms hat. Uh, we'll have produce available, farm fresh eggs. I think people really feel like they leave the city they leave all the old worries behind at the door. They come in and they really feel like they've rented a different place. Uh, there's like magic in the air and with a beer in your hand, what more could you ask for? Derek and today we're going to do some rail riding. <laughs> this is Greg and uh, Troy. <laughs> two, two, three, 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 three. So as soon as they're done uh, putting everything together over there, we're going to start flying down the tracks this way and eventually fly over that bridge you see there in the distance. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, it looks like we hit the end of the tracks right here. After about five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna go back down the other way? Yeah. All right. That's what I'm saying, you start drinking, I got it. And you start forgetting. Yeah, I got I got this. Yeah. You can see here we hit some tracks that were fear caused us not to look. Oh, this is gonna be a good one. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> that kind of derailed us. <laughs> There wasn't really any incident that drove me towards Hinduism. My father became very interested in meditation, in teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. He didn't really push anything on me, but I just saw it how it changed him. I think just the silent example of his life had more of an influence. When I was around 15, that's when I really started to dive into Hindu thought, and then the music came along and a lot more of the culture. A lot of people do ask, what is the yoga of music? The goal of yoga is samadhi, which is oneness of mind with God. In the times of ancient India, they would use music and sound, gather their thoughts together and their emotions together, and direct that to a one-pointed focus on God. When music is aimed at that same goal, then it does become a form of yoga. One of my favorite quotes is by Paramahansa Yogananda. He said that kirtan is an effective form of yoga, necessitating intense concentration and absorption in the seed, thought, and sound. But it doesn't mean that it, it's better than or can replace a lot of the modern music that's coming. If we lose our roots to those ancient forms of music, then we're really cutting roots from the tree. The tree will suffer and eventually die. When I'm on stage looking out at, at the audience, when I'm singing sacred music, I see them as devotees or as people who are interested in spiritual thought. I don't really see them as audience. Oh. 
To me, enlightenment means there's an awareness of the soul, there's an awareness of that immortal nature of who we are, some quality that we have to just consider divine because there's no other explanation for it. I look for a song that relates to my life. And I spend a lot of time learning the meanings, even if it's in Bengali or Hindi or Sanskrit, so that I can put my heart and my emotion, my, my whole being into those words when I'm singing them. But it's hard to go from busy life straight into meditation and the sacred music is a bridge. I don't have control of circumstances but I do have control of how I respond to them and having a portable paradise within that wherever you go you can carry that with you. I'm not always successful at doing it but knowing that I have that potential within me, the sacred music can take that emotion whatever it is and calm me and bring me within into a center, everything just changes. Everything changes. Show me! I could beat you, but instead, I think I'm going to have to disconnect you entirely. 
game over. To make a guitar feels like, it feels like a journey. It feels like, it feels like you had to travel somewhere because the whole process is one of gradually making smaller and smaller and smaller minute adjustments to this finished thing until finally it's done. So you start with big tools, big rough cuts, big pieces of wood and slowly start removing everything that doesn't need to be there. So the whole thing is this gradually diminishing, increasingly careful process until you finally get where it needed to go and then you just stop touching it. At a certain point, I don't know if many artists can really separate themselves out of the work they do. And so for me, as I relate to a building a guitar, there are so many different factors and so many variables that can influence the way your thought process, the way you're gonna go about something, just the very motions of your hands that day, how sharp your tools are. There are so many different variables that you're gonna approach it with the knowledge that you're there in that present moment and the instrument is going to reflect the experience that you've had as a builder plus the inspiration that you have in that very moment. So really an instrument ends up being a snapshot of what that builder was like, their whole state of being at the time that it was built. There's so many different avenues and so many different seemingly unrelated activities that go into building one guitar. Each have their own unique kind of pleasures that go with them. Like I love sharpening tools still. Just the peripheral activities of making a tool ready to do its task is wonderful. 
I love bending the sides and feeling a piece of really stiff wood that grew straight and true, feeling it slowly be formable and take on this new shape where it's really gonna sing. Carving braces and wringing every last bit of tone or volume out of a diaphragm, a, this moving plate that's the top of a guitar or the back of a guitar and getting the, just the right size and shape on every one of those components. They all have a certain, they've all got their own charms. Anyway, so I don't know if I could really say there's one particular part of building a guitar, but I will say that to tune it up when it's finally done and play the first couple of notes and hear how all these parts for the first time are working together, that's, that's pretty special. The steel string guitar in particular is a very young instrument. If you look at the, the music world as a whole, you look at pianos which have hundreds of years of development behind them. You look at the bowed instrument world, violins where the violin really reached its modern form 300 years ago. You look at clarinets, you look at all these instruments that have hundreds of years of development and reached a certain level of refinement where they were more than what a musician could ask for. The steel string guitar is really only about 90 years old now. And right from its birth, it was built in a factory setting. The classical guitar tradition is pretty large, but not really the steel string guitar world, kind of what we consider the modern guitar. Over my working lifetime, what my goal is, is to take this thing that we've built, these guitars that are really consistently good, they're real, expressive, they're fine instruments, but continuing to re refine and develop them until they turn into something that is more than what a musician could ask for. That's what's next.